to uh, a series of four kind of sub-districts within your business district. So uh, Paul is going to talk about the two northern districts. If you imagine this like the barbell, the two, two bells. And then there's, uh, and those are what we're calling the northern and southern T5 to link it back to the code uh, to, and to show what kind of possibilities they may see over, over time. But then the Flex Village, uh, which is really your more uh, or most diverse set of uses and building types. It's because of the assets you have there, such as what we're just placeholder names, or all of these, but what we're just calling Boutique Row, where you've got uh, Marty's and you've got a jewelry shop, you've got the coffee shop. Uh, you've got the funeral home, which is a beautiful building that kind of feels like a civic building. Uh, and anything from that kind of scale to residential to small retailers, this is really your most diverse mix. So we're calling that the Flex Village because we really don't know how that's going to evolve over time. That's, that's a very, very dynamic place. And then the core in the middle uh, with uh, well, two real districts. One is a very realizable, what we're calling a retail street that's about, uh, say, about 200 feet long. It's about 20 to 30,000 square feet. It's about the size that we think uh, you can really realistically support given. Uh, a medium increase in density over the next uh, few years. And then just north of that, a restaurant row that goes to support some of the theater uses and things that uh, could go in there. And we'll, we'll unpack those a little more in a bit. But Paul, first, I think, if you wanted to talk about the two nodes. Thanks, Joe. I'm Paul Ostergaard with Urban Design Associates. Um, one of the observations we had of first visited um, this, this area was um, that the street is wrong right now for supporting a Main Street environment. Um, it's four lanes during the most important retailing hours of the day. Um, and on the off hours, you can park along um, Hamilton, but the parking meters are almost invisible. There's no paint on the street to indicate that you're, say, if you're able to park. Uh, it's very difficult, actually, to find to see parking spaces, I think. Um, the four lanes encourages fairly high-speed traffic movement through the district. So there's, a, there's, there's little uh, friction there. And every good Main Street has friction, so that it slows cars down um, and uh, makes it easier for pedestrians to cross streets makes it easier for motorists to see what's going on in the buildings that are on the main street. And so we, uh, I uh, came to the rather firm belief that you have to do something about the street before you can really encourage much redevelopment um, in, in uh, College Hill. And so actually before I get into a discussion about the, uh, some of these, some of these districts, I'd like to invite Rick Hall to come up to talk about um, your street, your main street here, what it is like today, and what and some of the ideas we have, some of the alternatives that we have for the future to make it um, a better main street, to make it friendlier for pedestrians, friendlier for motorists. Um, right now, when you're walking on the street, it's hard to pass within a few feet of you going 40 miles an hour. That's not very comfortable. And so, Rick, uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, chat with us a little bit about uh, uh, the, the possibilities that we see. Okay, I'll be glad to. Great. Um, I have been uh, to Cincinnati, yeah, I think, four times now, four or five times. Um, so we've been discussing the concepts of walkability in neighborhoods um, for quite some time. So some of you may have heard this discussion before. Um, over the last uh, 15 years or so, we've been working with urban designers. I'm a, I'm a traffic engineer. I'm a civil engineer specializing in traffic engineering and planning. Uh, and Dwayne Carver uh, is a transportation planner that works with me in Tallahassee, Florida. And um, uh, so we, we go to good planning sessions like this with good urban designers from coast to coast and we, we helped uh, fill in with the transportation part. And the main thing we've learned from them is that it's important to talk about the concept and the scale and the structure of the neighborhood first 
and then talk about the transportation second. If you do it the other way around when you're trying to plan like this and you say, all right, the transportation is going to be thus, then you've tied one hand behind their back. You know, you're saying, well, go ahead now, design the best town you can given the transportation we've already figured out. So there is, it, it's an inversion that is, uh, that is difficult for many of my uh, colleagues, uh, civil engineers, transportation engineers across the country. Because for uh, 40 or 50 years now, uh, they have been saying, <coughs> what's the demand? What, what's the number of vehicles that will be running up and down the street? And, and that's what we have to solve. And when you solve those really well, uh, the pedestrians become extinct. The bicyclists are not there. The transit is very hard to make it make work. Because a transit trip is simply a platform where pedestrians get on and pedestrians get off. That's what a transit vehicle is as it moves. So great walkability is, is the best thing you can do uh, to, to get great transit working in your, in your area. So, um, <clears throat> so it's that paradigm shift where we have to move away from uh, uh, traffic volume being the number one design parameter uh, and, and the number one becomes speed of the motor vehicles in the presence of pedestrians. And then as a secondary issue, you consider what the volumes are and, and what, what the car drivers need to get through uh, the area in a logical uh, amount of time. So um, you, you've heard the term T5 here and T5 there and T4 in the middle. Those are all terms that relate to the zoning code that, uh, that are very um, important to us, to Dwayne and myself, because that tells us what kind of street is appropriate for that area. Uh, and, and the degree of parking you need and the speed and the number of lanes are all woven together to get the right, uh, uh, right uh, street design. Um, so it's important that the great walkability happen not only along the the thoroughfare going through, but actually if somebody wants to come from this house, they have to have a logical way to walk and get down into that uh, town center, go to a cafe, meet their friends, go to the post office, whatever they're going to do. Um, so walkability in from the neighborhoods calls for attention to the specific street details on every one of the neighborhood streets, as well as the, the, the main street um, that is um, that is there to where the buildings face the main street. Um, so we look for opportunities to uh, to manage the speed of the motor vehicles as you go through the main street sections. Um, and you, you could be out in a, uh, a lower density area um, and, and, and uh, you could be driving 35 miles an hour, sometimes even 40, but then you need to have a step down in the speed um, and to eventually get to 25 miles per hour in the commercial facing buildings that are along the thoroughfare in the center of town. So that's our design and posted speed the same uh, for, uh, for as the foundation for developing the good thoroughfares. Dwayne, if you could come on up, please. Um, so we, we will, uh, by the time that this week is over, we will have tailored uh, each of these contexts with correct streets to have them perform uh, well as, uh, as pedestrian friendly streets. And Dwayne has worked up a couple of uh, uh, street sections. You want to use the drawings over there, Dwayne? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, if you'll think for just a minute about what, um, what Harrison looks like, uh, pretty much as it Hamilton. goes right through the middle of the Westwood, and uh, also what Hamilton looks like. Not the, the, the wide section at the corners of the turn lanes, but in the middle, where you have the, just the four lanes that go through. Um, one of the things we've heard is that, well, we have on-street parking, but nobody uses it. And part of the reason for that, as we've already alluded to, is it doesn't look like on-street parking it belongs there. It looks like a four-lane road, and it's kind of counterintuitive that you would park on. So one of the things we wanted to show you were some options that may, will make it more obvious that, yes, you're supposed to park here, and no, it's not really a four-lane road. Um, one of the things that we found is that traffic volumes have fallen, so it's actually possible now to start doing road diets and things that may have been less feasible in the past. So we're going to propose some of those in some of these places. Uh, and you get a chance to get up and look at these. These are actually both the same width of street. Uh, here, this is a um, um, your 60 or your 40 foot wide street that you have on Hamilton and on Harrison. This is the same thing. This is two different treatments. 
Rick was talking about the difference between T4 and T5 and how we do different things in different places. Let me focus on this one first. This is your T5, kind of a main street section that you can have. And what we've done is, we, right now what you mostly have is a, a five foot sidewalk, maybe it seems skinnier than that, but it was five foot when I measured it, and then you have a planting strip or a verge that sometimes has trees in it, sometimes not. Uh, and then you're right next to the, to the speeding traffic. So what this is calling for is in these areas where you would see buildings built back up to the street again, you actually would pave that and you'd have tree wells instead of the, of the verge, which gives you more space for the pedestrians to circulate um, and also begins to provide a nice even marching row of trees. Have the on-street parking next to the curb. And in the middle, we've really got more room than we want. We want to have the lanes down around 10 feet wide to really make the traffic uh, speeds work better. Here's some good news. When I was out there measuring the other day with, with my speed gun in the off peaks, uh, anybody want to venture to guess how fast the traffic was moving on Harrison at um, 1030 on a Monday afternoon? 45 miles per hour. 45? Yeah. Anybody higher? Anybody lower? I was clocking them in the low 30s. Right. Yeah, and it seemed much faster. And I expected it to be much faster. They built another day, it would be much faster. But the day we were there clocking it, they were lower than that. But you know, as pedestrians everywhere know, that when those speeds get over 30, it feels unsafe. And it is unsafe. We've got graphs that prove it's unsafe um, like when you get hit at that speed. So that's too fast. But the good news is we're not trying to bring speeds down from 45. We're trying to bring them down from 33. So these, these things I'm talking about here, keeping those lanes narrower, will help get those speeds lower. The on-street parking will lower the speeds. Once we, once we get the speeds down below 30, we don't need bike lanes anymore. We can actually start sharing the road uh, between cyclists and motorists again. So that's something that we show here with these shared lane markings. Uh, to keep the lane width a little narrower, we're introducing something called the safety strip. And you actually are already using these in Cincinnati in different places. It's a textured strip that you put in sometimes as a median. Um, what it allows you to do is if you have a very large truck for some reason that comes down the biggest truck allowed by law and they need to get down this road, um, we no longer have to design a 12 foot wide lane so that we can accommodate that vehicle. We can, it's okay to let them rumble over this thing and they'll, they'll be all right once they get down the road. Everybody else won't drive over it because it's uncomfortable and feels weird. That means you're driving here, which means you have to slow down because somebody could open up the door and, and, and hit your car. So you want to slow down. So that keeps the traffic slow automatically. We don't have to re-sign it. We don't have to say now the speed limit is 25. Eventually you will do that, but you just build it and, this, and the cars will slow down. Right? So you get speed limit by design, not by posting a sign, which really doesn't work anyway. So you your the other option we looked at um, will not work everywhere, but there are some places that will work, and this is where you use reverse angle parking. Now, I know you've had some experiences with head-in angle parking. There's some reasons we found that we don't recommend that anymore. Uh, one is that uh, you're having to back out blind in the traffic not so much a problem with cars, but it really scares the dickens out of bicyclists if you're riding along behind a car, heading angle park, and you don't know what's going to happen to you. See the brake lights come on. Um, this way, you can actually see what's coming and react to it. I've shown here a car with the door open to illustrate the fact that if you have small children and you're unloading them out of the car, and the doors are open, instead of shunting them into the travel lane, where they do get killed sometimes, I have personal knowledge of that, um, this is shunting them back toward the side. If you come out of the side, out of the, out of a shop, and you've got groceries or packages or something, you can load them right into your truck, okay? And then when you get ready to leave, you can see where the traffic's going. The other nice thing about this is a lot of times the engineers want to have, uh, when you do head and angle parking, they want to have the parking space, and they want to have some shy distance behind it, and then the travel lane. So you end up with these really wide streets just to do the angle parking. You don't need that. Uh, you can actually put the travel lane right next to the angle parking. So in your 40-foot existing space, you can get one lane of reverse angle parking and still have two travel lanes. So you just will have two travel lanes that you, that you need, and you got your reverse angle parking. Now, if everything goes well, you actually get more parking spaces with reverse angle parking. It hardly ever goes that way. Uh, what you need is a lot of space where there's no interruptions along the block face, and there are a couple places that we found in your areas that we're looking at where that is actually true, uh, but you have to look at it very carefully to see what the trade-off is between parking both sides parallel versus parking one side on the reverse angle. But it is an option that you can use if you wanted to make you aware of it because there are some places that like to recommend it. Rick. When we proposed this in South Carolina, they liked all of Dwayne's regular engineering oriented uh, benefits of this thing, safety and all. And then they, they came up with another one. They said, you know, this would be great for tailgating. <laughs> so you, you open the back of that uh, van or RV, whatever you have, and trunk of your car, and you get the sandwiches going. and. Uh, 
that's what they cared most about in South Carolina. Are you going to do Trump retreat out of here? <laughs> uh, I'll be glad to answer questions about this. Don't forget you've got buses coming down here. Three different number 17 buses from collect by the time they hit North Bend in South. They're all, all there. Yeah, they'll work for that. We're also looking at that. You'll see some of the different uh, intersection options that we've got as well. We have a program called Auto Turn that lets us um, test the, whether or not vehicles can move through these intersections uh, on the computer before we actually you know, finalize the design. Uh, and we use that routinely to make sure whatever design vehicle we're working for, we'll get either it's a transit bus or a school bus or a factory trailer. So or a fire truck. Point that we are aware of that. Fire truck or a beer truck. <coughs> whatever you want to test. And we recognize that some of these changes are going to be controversial. Anytime you go from four lanes of moving traffic down to two lanes, that's going to be a concern to a lot of people. So sometimes what cities do is they bring out the, the traffic cones and, it, and some, sometimes some paint, and they set up a temporary situation where they close off the out, outside lane or the curb lanes for a couple months, three months, and they, and they see how the traffic performs on that street. It's a low-cost way to do a test to see if the traffic and uh, planning assumptions are, are valid or not. So um, uh, we think that this is something that's important for uh, College Hill to consider. Um, I personally believe that if you, if you do change your street and enable someone to pull over during rush hour to get a cup of coffee or coming home to maybe you know, stop a, at, a, at, a, at a store, a grocery store or something, um, you begin to see more economic activity along that street. And uh, it, people, uh, potential tenants, will look more seriously at available space in College Hill because uh, it's a much friendlier street for motorists and for pedestrians as well. So it's something to, uh, to seriously consider. Since we do have a fire station at the south and the business district, how much say do they have in a in street design? Can they fire station fire companies often are very much involved in the decisions about road design because they have equipment that have, they have to maneuver through, they have to get access to fire hydrants and all sorts of things. So they will probably play a review role. I don't know what Cincinnati specific policies are, but in, in most cities uh, fire departments want to Fire chief wants to review the plans for streets in the process. So, do you know if they have the authority to overrule? I don't know. I, I, someone from the city here would be able to answer that question uh, more adequately. Michael, doesn't does the POTE act on behalf of the new coordinator of the fire department? We just went through an issue up in Mount Adams where we were going to have to remove the parking across their equipment. Uh, it's nine foot two inches wide, and by the time we permitted parking on both sides of the street, they had nine feet eight inches to actually travel through. So we managed to work out a compromise on that, but it's an issue of coordination to make the final determination. The other thing is good luck on him from having to stay out. And, um, you know, five years ago when we did the three state, you know, good luck talking to the city and ODOT about making any changes that we really wanted to. And, and um, so good luck. Hopefully, well, the city will, thank you. Hopefully, hopefully the city will listen this time. Yeah. So we brought in some heavy hitters because I think all of us on the team felt that if you don't make some dramatic changes to the design of your street, that very little is going to happen in terms of improvements. Oh, we, we agree. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's why we have Rick and Dwayne on board. Um, they fight that battle frequently. Uh, they, Rick actually has uh, first hand experience working with state DOTs. So, A few words of encouragement. Um, the Federal uh, Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration, is um, more in a mood to deal with walkability and bicycling than they have ever before. Um, so, so they're they're getting on board. Uh, we worked on a, uh, a a recommended practice for the Institute of Transportation <coughs> Engineers, and uh, in Washington, we went there six or eight times and work through all the details of it. And it's uh, designing uh, walkable urban thoroughfares. So these concepts are emerging. Um, it's, it's interesting that 
they come from the bottom up. They come from neighbors like you saying, this is logical, let's do it. And then it comes from the top in Washington because they get the ideas. And the state, uh, you know, generally understaffed and, and, and you know, are going to classes all the time to learn the new stuff. They're kind of the last guys on the block to find out about some of these newest ideas because they're working so hard. Right? Mm -hmm. The city, too. The yeah. city wouldn't fight for its Especially with today's economy, it's very important to have economic sustainability. And street design relates to that very directly. So. Yeah, let me say a couple other things before we, we move on to uh, Westwood. Is uh, Ed Stark, <coughs> our economist, has been doing some initial data and sort of demographic <coughs> assessment, and which is very helpful and informative to the design team. But the current sort of number of households that you, people that you have within, uh, I think he's the half mile shed, um, means that you can support about 500 linear feet of shop front spaces. So that uh, tells us a couple of things, is we need to focus where you kind of want your prime sort of vibrant Main Street to be. The other thing is thinking about where densities can be increased so that your Main Street can grow and you can support more of that. And I would say it's also about creating the type of place that sort of becomes a destination, just like when people go to Hyde Park Square or North Side or wherever else, so it becomes a destination. So you're bringing people to come to your neighborhood from outside of it to support that. So once again, it will continue to grow Hello. over uh, a longer period of time. Uh, did you, Paul, did you say everything you wanted to say? No, I, I, we need to go through a, a describe a few uh, development initiatives here for the <coughs> community. Uh, I wanted to take you through the end, the, the sort of end uh, pieces, and then Joe will talk uh, about the middle. This is the city-owned land. There's a parcel here. This is North Bend. 